Hello, this video is to help you prepare for region auditions in Texas in 2019 on our three furling etudes. First, let's start with just some general practice tips. First, I would always mark your fingerings when you practice. Left Fs, le left E flats, forked Fs, occasionally maybe a right A flat, and there are some places in this with some interesting finger combinations that you want to make sure you've planned exactly what you're going to do on before you start practicing them so that you don't practice them inconsistently and cause yourself some trouble that way. So I would always do that. I would also be on the lookout in each etude that you know the key, that you notice any scales or arpeggios that appear, and let that help you. If you recognize a musical pattern like that that you practiced or can practice separately, it can make it a lot easier to deal with when it shows up in the middle of the piece. Um, also, in general, slow practice is always a good idea. When you start practicing the fast etudes especially, I would practice them at a very slow tempo for accuracy, for musicality, so that you notice all the little details, articulations, that kind of thing. It can also help to practice in small pieces. Um, there's a few different ways to do that. One is you can go from one beat to the next, and I would end on the beat, not on the note before it. It's a little more musical usually, um, and it can help make sure you don't have a, a disconnect with the fingering that you don't notice. So in the third etude, that would be something like, would be one piece that you might practice. Um, you can also practice measure to measure. Or you can find note groupings, which are sort of like musical words. And people can disagree on where those are, that's fine. Listen to your own teacher, make sure, uh, make sure what you found makes sense for you. Here's me practicing with some note groupings that I like for this. So I put some pauses there so that I have smaller pieces to deal with so that I can make sure everything within them is correct. And then I can put it all together more easily. more sense to me and I've checked through everything and made sure that I understand what's in that measure. So that's a really good technique. You can also use dotted rhythms, especially on a lot of the technical pas passages. Let's take a look at measure 11 in Etude 3 again. So here we have um, a C-sharp diminished seventh arpeggio, which is another good thing to know. <laughs> tricky for oboes. We know the G to B flat is a cross fingering and sometimes we're not as clean on that as we'd like to be. So we'll do some dotted rhythms on this to help us out. When you do dotted rhythms you always want to do it both ways. First you want to play long then short. And then short and then long. issues that you've got uh, hiding in there. It forces you to practice every pair of notes very quickly with enough time between them to make sure that you did the ones you thought you did and did them well. Um, so that's a good technique. Anytime you have something slur or something tongued, you might want to practice it slurred, like at measure 17 in etude 3, just to make sure your fingers are doing what you think they're doing. So maybe first you would play add the tongue back to it. See, my E to D flat was not as clean as I'd have liked it to be. It can help to clean it up if you know that your fingers are moving evenly and then add your tongue back. The first etude this year, which is furling number 30. It's in 4-4, which should be familiar. It's in E major, which hopefully is somewhat familiar. You want to make sure you're comfortable with your E major scale and especially with your E major arpeggio all the way up to that high E. This etude also has a lot of tonguing. You might practice some articulation exercises by themselves. You likely already do some with your band. Maybe some... That kind of thing. Just to get your tonguing speed up a little bit. Make sure that your air is consistent and that you're not too heavy with the tongue. You want to keep that light. Um, 
anytime you have notes change a lot while you tongue, like in measure 19 and 20 especially, you probably would, would do better to practice that slurred first to make sure your fingers are even and then add your tongue to it. That can be a good technique. Be careful when you have slurs going into tonguing that you keep things even. Those two note slurs, especially the ones with the accents on the first note, can be easy to rush. That hopefully was fairly even. Sometimes students will play something more like the accent will make people want to play the note too short, so you want to watch out for that tendency. In this etude, the second measure has um, a couple of altered sets of two note slurs. That can be a little tricky. You might spend a little extra time on Maybe that first time I rushed the E a little bit. The E to C sharp can also be a slightly interesting slur sometimes, so make sure you spend some time on that. The third measure, we have a bunch of jumps up to high C. We want to make sure that the high C's match everything. We don't want to have weak air or be biting because that's going to make them be really out of tune. We want to keep our, our embouchure fairly round and our air nice and strong so that they can match what's near them. And not stick out too much. They have accents on them, but they're also more than an octave above the notes next to them. They may come out enough on their own. That's up to you and your teacher. Go back and forth, see what you like but don't overdo them. I want to avoid anything that sounds like this. You see, they'll jump out really quite a lot if you encourage them too much. They are high C after all. So think about what makes sense within the context of the music. Let's see, then we have that E2 octave arpeggio. We want to make sure that we're clean all the way up to that. In measure 11, we have a high D sharp and a high C sharp next to each other. Make sure you're correct on the fingerings for that. Sometimes people get a little bit forgetful on those high note fingerings when they don't play them as often. Be very certain on those, especially on the high C sharp. Make sure that you kick these two fingers up into the air or it may not come out. And they might be a little bit tired given what's before it, so make sure they go up. Um, measures 19 and 20 are pretty definitely the hardest part of this piece. Those I would absolutely practice slurred before you practice them tongued, and I might even do something like this where you play each little note pairing several times before you move on. And then just go to the one. though I've spent some time on this, that when you switch from F sharp to G in the middle, it can be easy to have a problem there because we're going from this finger staying put to it lifting. And that can be a little tricky to pull off cleanly. And then we do some of that and we go back to it staying down. So those transitions especially may take a little extra work. And then you can add the tongue back to it. To shape through the lower notes, you'll notice there's a chromatic pattern there. We also have, in addition to that challenge, the second to last note of the piece is a low B. So it'll be the end of the piece, you might be a little bit tired, but make sure that you haven't like squished your shoulders up and hunched over and started bite or gotten your air too weak. We know low B needs us to be you know, nice and open and using a good airstream to speak well, and it's right there at the end, so make sure you still are. In this attitude, we also have a B major arpeggio full range in measure 16. That is another thing that can be a particular challenge on oboe because of those lowest two notes. D sharp, as we know, uses either this pinky or this one. B requires both of these or these. You can choose, but that doesn't really help you with the D sharp much. So we have a problem there on oboe. There's a couple ways to solve it. And again, listen to your private teacher. They may do something different to do what feels best for your hands. Just make sure that whichever one you're doing, you can control it and do it cleanly. I would slur back and forth whichever way you pick so that you know you can, you can definitely keep it under control. So the first option, this right here is an alternate low C key. Um, you do still have to keep this hole closed when you use it, which can make it a bit of a challenge, especially if your fingers are smaller. So when you hit the D sharp, F sharp, 
D sharp. If you get your finger on top of that, it won't go down yet. If your D sharp key is down, that can't go down. It forces it up. And then when you hit the B key over here for low B, and you lift off the D sharp key, it should go down. So then you just have to trade pinkies. You do have to make sure again that that hole under there stays covered. So. <laughs> So I can control that one if I need to, though it's a bit uncomfortable for me. The other options use the left pinky. There's a couple different ways to deal with this, but you can use this D sharp key and this B key. One way is to stick your pinky right between them, push for D sharp, pull for B. You see I'm forcing that key over and you can see the key work on the bottom of the oboe move when I do it. I have to be pretty forceful. It's not comfortable. You might end up with a bit of a red spot on your pinky. That's normal. So, make sure you are coordinating your C pinky. The other um, option over here is very similar, but instead of sticking my pinky between, I can put the tip of my pinky on the D sharp key, drop my hand a little bit so that my knuckle is ready to catch this B key, and just tilt back and forth right there. When you do both of these, be careful that you don't lose control over this G finger on its hole. So try those options, discuss others with your teacher, and pick the one that feels the least terrible to you, and make sure you practice it by itself enough and in the arpeggio enough that it won't be a problem for you in the middle of the piece. Now let's talk about etude number two. This is furling number nine, which is an F major. It's written in 3-4, but the eighth note gets the beat. That's especially important to note in this one, because as is common with the slow etudes, this is by far the trickiest rhythmic etude, especially just in terms of straightforward counting. You've got to remember that the eighth note gets the beat. You have to make sure that you do definitely understand how long the notes you're playing are. We start with some much longer notes, half notes, four beats in this case, quarter notes. You've got to make sure that you're starting with a really strong pulse. We know that sometimes when we're nervous, we don't do that as well as we know we should. So that's definitely something to look out for in this, that you start with a really good pulse and you count through those first several notes. Then make sure when you get to the triplets, to the 16th notes, to the 32nd notes, you spot the difference and you know how long each one is and control that well. Um, remember, by the way, that when you have several staccatos under a slur, we interpret that as tonguing legato, typically. We have that pretty early on in that first line. So, we also have uh, breathing and endurance issues, as is typical in our slow etude. This is a much more tiring one, especially if you make it to one of the later rounds and end up playing the whole piece. So make sure you've got a good breathing plan. You might not want to breathe in at every opportunity. You might want to split it up and breathe out in some. Looking at the first line, I can see that there's a breath in the sixth measure and also in the fourth measure. And musically, the places those breaths are suggest to me that I would be pretty okay to breathe in the sixth measure as well, as long as it's not too big. So what I do is I turn that middle one into an out breath. dioxide sometimes on oboe because it doesn't all come out through the instrument. So take advantage of some opportunities to do that. In the longer rests, make sure you do do that. Uh, this is the musical etude, so make sure that you're shaping the phrases as well as you can. Remember that vibrato is also a tool to shape phrases. It's not all dynamics. So the beginning, you can do a lot to shape through the, um, the first couple measures with vibrato. in your toolbox and use it. That'll help you get a lot more expression without having to use your full dynamic range in every phrase and therefore lose some of the bigger dynamics, which you do also want to try to get. Um, we have in this etude quite a lot of jumps, especially down. The ending is the worst of it on oboe. I think it's actually a little better on English one than oboe, which is interesting. The middle part is the opposite. 
uh, those low C's right at the end and piano and then pianissimo, uh, that is a serious challenge right there. So you again have to make sure that you're careful how you respond to fatigue. It's very natural to scrunch forward a little, to start to use weaker air, to start to bite. You have to fight those instincts. You gotta use your corners, keep your posture nice and relaxed as best you can, keep your air strong but not squished, very open for those low C's. And don't don't risk it too much. We would like that to be relatively soft, but don't play it softer than you can control it. You might also consider trying some forked Fs, especially in that pianissimo measure, and that can help bring that dynamic down on the Fs. Um, and it's a more muffled, fuzzy note, but this might be a situation where you might want that. Again, discuss with your teacher, consider what you like. Uh, in the interest of making that ending a little bit easier, make sure that your mezzo forte in measure 33 is quite strong. Uh, I really don't let it be a mezzo piano. You might go just a little farther than mezzo forte so that the contrast to the end stands out a little bit more and you can get away with a little more volume on those low C's if you do that sometimes. Measures 24 and 25 also have some challenging slurs downward this time to low D. Um, we also notice the high note moves chromatically. We want to shape across that and we see a diminuendo written across both measures. And you might want to mark that diminuendo for you in a more visible way so that you don't end up too soft in the second measure and have nowhere to go. That tells me that we should actually start that quite loud so that we can make a very dramatic, very musically interesting diminuendo and it may help those first couple of slurs as well. A couple technical things. Measure seven, you may see two sets of slurs, one every other note and one that crosses the first eight. The one that crosses the first eight, I've looked, is in all the older editions and everything. Those smaller ones seem to be unique to this one as far as I've seen. So since they gave us both, uh, we'll take the bigger one this year. Hope that's okay, everyone. Um, and we'll try to make a big deal out of those accents with vibrato and with leaning and make those come out very musically. In measure 12, you have a turn and you see a natural sign underneath the turn. That natural sign tells you that instead of a B flat, like you would normally have in that turn, you would have the written note, which is C, the note above D, C again, in the key we would normally have B flat if there were no natural there, and then C, and that would be your turn, which is the same shape the turn makes. Um, so because there's a natural sign, we do a B natural instead. This low C that the turn is on is one and a half beats long. So a very typical way to, to, do, to deal with that rhythmically would be to do a half beat of C, a half beat of the triplet D, C, B natural, and then a half beat of C again. So that would be your turn right there. Three is in six eight time and in F minor. Make sure you're comfortable with the F minor scales, especially the harmonic form, which shows up a couple of times in this etude, and with the F minor arpeggio all the way up to the high F, which also happens here. Um, in 6-8 time, we want to be careful that we play musically and that we let those last 16th notes of a measure push forward. So. feel like they're not going anywhere, those last tongue notes, we want them to push forward. Just like in the first etude, when you have a bunch of tongue notes in a row, whether they're staccatos on them or not at this speed, you've got to work to keep your air consistent and to keep your tonguing light. Notice that the accents should probably work a lot better as air accents than as tongue accents. Um, for the most part, you, you generally get a better result on oboe leaning with your air rather than tonguing heavily, especially with those C's because we don't want those to pop out of the texture too much. Um, there's arpeggios absolutely everywhere, everywhere in this etude. It will help you if you can identify them and maybe even practice them isolated a little bit. That kind of thing can really help. You want to notice where patterns change. Measure 19, for example, those last few notes in the measure don't quite work like they do at the beginning. That grace note makes things feel a lot different because it's going into the third note of the beat rather than the first. Uh, measure 7, you want to identify your arpeggios and you want to make sure 
that you can get cleanly up to those high notes. Make sure, of course, that your high note fingerings are accurate, that they work well on your instrument, and that you're getting to what you think you're getting to. You don't want, for example, to end up leaving the third octave key down on the high D, which will make your high D extremely sharp. That kind of thing, make sure it's clean. When you're getting to the third octave key note like that high E, remember that you don't have to have the thumb on a second octave key note. So there, E, G, C. Now my thumb is free to get to the third octave key. You can play that E with the first octave key, but it comes out a little bit better with the third, and that's how you'll want to get there probably. Some people do hop, but I, I think it's a little easier if you give yourself that chance to get to it by coming up off of the first octave key on the high C. Um, measures 13 and 14. Make sure that you spot that that F sharp and the E flat both continue throughout the measure. Um, it's an F sharp diminished seven arpeggio. We don't want to suddenly play a different arpeggio in the second half of the measure because we forgot one of those accidentals. Um, and the A to C there is tricky on oboe. It's another one of those cross fingerings where it's easy for things to be just a little bit messy. Can turn into one but the second one really easily we can end up with a little ghost note in there and there's a lot of those over and over here so pay a little extra attention to that especially when you're practicing slowly to make sure you're ready to play it very cleanly um, 15 and 16 and measures 29 and 30 are on the trickier side the arpeggios here change very quickly. It can help to identify them. There are a lot of half hole and octave transitions that can definitely trip you up and cause things to not sound quite like they ought to. So these may need a little extra slow practice, a little bit of extra dotted rhythm work. Um, also here, make sure you're grouping musically. So let those last few 16th notes of the beat lead you into the next beat. So you feel that those go forward musically. We want to have that effect and not which can happen if you're not thinking about it. So remember to push them forward instead. So we get a more musical effect there. A lot of careful work for those transitions. Um, in measure 25, you're building into a rest. It's probably a good idea to do something with that last beat. Maybe slow it down, maybe crescendo, maybe decrescendo. Your teacher probably has their own ideas. You may have your own ideas, and that's great. I don't think I would leave it alone if you don't do anything with it. And it's a little bit boring. If you do something with it, now we can tell that I'm going to do something exciting in the next measure. What you do is up to you. Notice that when you come back in, in measure 27, the articulation is different in that first beat than it's been every other time you've had that kind of figure. So watch out for that, make sure you honor that. Um, and then probably one of the trickiest parts of this etude, uh, measure 19 and 20, and also the second to last measure. They have some similar problems and some similar solutions. Uh, the first issue we see with both is that we have D flats next to low C's. That's not great on oboe. There's not really a wonderful way to do it. But there are a couple options. The first is to just do this with your pinky. You can have both keys down on D flat like this. You don't have to get all the way up and that can make it easier. So we can see that that works fine and I can get to the B from it too. You can also uh, use this alternate low C key over here. Uh, that means that as long as you hit that going into that D flat, so D flat, D flat, and you've got to hit that and cover that hole on the D key, then you only have to move the pinky because this takes the C key down for you. So that's already down because of that alternate key. So we can see that takes care of that. And that works for the other two. So. Whichever one you do, make sure you practice it plenty and you can definitely control it in tempo uh, and you can get to it. Remember, if you use this alternate key, you have to be there by the D flat. If you try to get here and slide over, it's not impossible, but I wouldn't trust it myself. Uh, the second to last measure, we have a bit of an extra complication, not because of the B, that's fine either way. See, either one of those works just fine. 
This is your alternate C pinky for the B as well, so you don't have to add a pinky back. But the forked F, or the F rather, after that, it doesn't have to be forked. Um, the F after that can cause a problem. Because the note after that F is A flat, I would normally use a forked F there. But if I use a forked F and I don't get off this alternate key, instead of ah, I get ah, it's not an F anymore at all. So that won't work. So if I do this system, I'm going to have to use left F and then go to right A flat. If I use the pinky um, waving one, I can use forked F and regular A flat. So you can choose whichever is easiest for you. You might not do the same in both places. I tend to use the alternate C pinky in that first one. Um, or the alternate C key here, and in the ending I tend to use this so that I can avoid having to do all of the right A flat stuff. Uh, good luck on the etudes. I hope this video was helpful.